All right, we are in Revelation chapter 16. Back to the Revelation for Bible-believing Christian studies. Uh, again, if you're new to these studies, if you just stumbled on this one, um, these are not expository studies that are designed to say exactly what's going to happen. Um, these are, I mean, there's some of that, that you have to say, but these are studies for Christians are not going to be there in the book of Revelation as far as we're going to be up with the Lord. Uh, definitely proven fact. Um, I've got hundreds of videos on that thing now, on the rapture issue. Pre-trib rapture is biblical doctrine. Um, but uh, what we can learn, what we're doing here is we're going through these chapters of Revelation, seeing what we can learn, what we can be challenged you know, by these scriptures for us today as Christians living in the church age. So that's what we're going to do. Verse 1, Revelation chapter 16, verse 1. And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. All right. God's wrath, his, the point of God's wrath is, it's reserved for people that are lost. Let me show you that. Turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 9 through 11. It says here, For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together, and edify one another, even as also ye do. The only people that can really cling to this, these three verses here and say it lines up with their system are those that believe in the pre-trib rapture. Uh, if you believe that you go through any part of that, what people falsely call the tribulation, it's actually called the time of Jacob's trouble or Daniel's 70th week. I have to say that over and over again because new people come along to the videos. But the only ones that can really hold on to these verses, 9 through 11, are pre-trib Bible-believing Christians. All right? Nobody else can hold on to it. You say, well, we're pre-wrath. Uh, well, there's a problem there because, you see, anybody that takes the mark of the beast, which shows up at the beginning with the Antichrist, they get the wrath of God. Read, read Revelation chapter 14, verses 9 through 11. Anybody that takes the mark gets the wrath of God. So don't tell me this thing of, well, God's wrath doesn't show up till halfway through or till right at the end or whatever, and we teach a system where we're there through all of it, but then get out or something like this. People come up with all kinds of stupid nonsense. No, the Christians leave before the uh, time of Jacob's trouble gets started there. Again, I've proved that for years and years and years, hundreds upon hundreds and hundreds of scriptures going through the Pauline epistles. I mean, they're just scriptures everywhere. Going through the book of Revelation, we've talked about this. Uh, there's stuff in the Old Testament. I mean, there's just so much that proves the pre-trib rapture. Anybody that still believes in it is just, you know, I don't know what to tell you. I feel bad for you. Go back to your little fantasy thing of John Nelson Darby in 1830 and stuff like this. Yeah, keep telling yourself that. Uh, it's a ridiculous argument. Revelation chapter 16, verse 2. And again, that's been answered many times over to the uh, Darby thing. Nobody taught the rapture before Darby. You know, yeah. But uh, anyhow, let's continue. Revelation chapter 16, verse 2. And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast, and upon them which worshipped his image. All right. Uh, interesting. What does noisome mean? Pretty interesting definition. Noisome, Webster's 1828 Dictionary. Noxious, to health, hurtful, mischievous, unwholesome, in, insalubrious, destructive as noisome winds, noisome effluvia, or miasmata, noisome pestilence. Number two, noxious, injurious. Number three, Offensive to the smell or other senses, disgusting, fetid, foul breath is noisome. I believe that when you take this mark of the beast, it's going to be in the hand. And I heard a guy say actually the one time that there's a small little like lithium battery or something in this chip that they are sticking into people. They're already doing it. People are already getting into this thing of, you know, biohacking and stuff like this. Ridiculous. They come out with this stuff. But... This guy said, what if they put a little lithium battery in this thing or some kind of electronic thing and, you know, at some point in time, these things kind of short circuit and it, you know, it 
burns on the inside and it actually creates a wound where you've taken this thing. And that wound, because it comes up from the inside, it's very hard, it's like battery acid that created the thing in your right hand. And it's like really, really a sore, bad thing and it actually starts to smell really bad because it's putrefying, rotted flesh. Boy, you know, how about that? That's going to be a lot of fun for people. All these celebrities, you know, I got the chip. I took the chip. You know, a couple of years later, it's this stinking, disgusting, you know, pussy thing on their hand. Wound. thought that was interesting. But what about Grievous? Turn back to Isaiah chapter 3. You know, this, this Mark of the Beast thing and all this, you know... Uh, biometric stuff that they're coming out with right now and they're they're promoting it and oh it's so it's so hot and sexy and everything else you know to to be you know cash is so yesterday and and you know let's just let's just buy everything with chips and with scanning and iris scans and facial recognition technology and all this other stuff here's how it's going to end up Isaiah chapter 3 verse 16 Moreover, the Lord saith, because the daughters of Zion are haughty and walk with stretched forth necks and wanton eyes, walking and mincing as they go and making a tinkling with their feet, putting little metal rings and little things on their feet, you know, and they're walking with their heads up and, you know, and stuff. Mm -hmm. Pretty much like the prideful women of today, the in style, you know, women. Verse 17, Therefore the Lord will smite with a scab the crown of the head of the daughters of Zion, and the Lord will discover their secret parts. In that day the Lord will take away the bravery of their tinkling ornaments about their feet, and their calls and their round tires like the moon, the chains and the bracelets and the mufflers, the bonnets and the ornaments of the legs, and the headbands and the tablets and the earrings, the rings and nose jewels, the changeable suits of apparels, the mantles and the wimples, and the crisping pins, the glasses and the fine linen, and the hoods and the veils. Okay, all the jewelry, all kinds of little things that they wear, trendy, hip, whatever else stuff. Mm -hmm. That's what the future of this whole, what is in style today, that's what the future is going to be for these people. Verse 24, And it shall come to pass that instead of sweet smell, there shall be stink. I love the bluntness of the word of God. And instead of a girdle, a rent. And instead of well-set hair, baldness. And instead of a stomacher, a girding of sackcloth. And burning instead of beauty. Thy men shall fall by the sword and thy mighty in the war. And her gates shall lament and mourn. And she being desolate shall sit upon the ground. That's what the future of the supermodels of today is. They don't get saved. They go into the time of Jacob's trouble. Right there's their future get to the end of the thing, you're going to see some, you know, come back to bring people to the judgment of the nations. Matthew chapter 25 talks about that. As Christians, we're going to be coming along, glorified, redeemed Christians, you know, as basically as angels. Um, again, that's a whole other study, but we're going to come back and we're going to be walking around getting people, taking them to judgment. And there's going to be some dirty, homeless looking woman sitting there in the dirt, you know, hair falling out, you know, probably teeth messing and stuff like as you Okay, come on. They're going to stand up. You're going to go, wait a second. Hey, that's so-and-so. They were in the movies. There's a celebrity right there. Look at them now. Hmm. Why? Because God's wrath got poured out. Come back to Revelation 16. Oh, if I could only be a celebrity. Yeah, then you'd end up that way too. You know, I mean, how many people can name a celebrity from the 1920s? Just off the top of your head, a famous celebrity from the 1920s or 1930s or 1940s or 1950s. A famous movie actress, beautiful woman from the day. You know, youth of today can't. You mean to tell me somebody could be famous and people forget who they are not even 100 years later? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And at the end of the whole thing, those that are alive in the time of Jacob's trouble, God just goes and pours his wrath out on them. says, hey, you there, angel, pour out your vial of wrath there. Noisome and grievous sore comes up. You know, one judgment. And those, all those microchip implants in the hand just burn. It's 
It's really something, isn't it? Actually, before we go back to Revelation, I want to look up one other thing here quick. Genesis chapter 18. You can keep your finger in Revelation 16. Probably you already had your finger out of it, but that's okay. Genesis chapter 18. We'll be back to Revelation 16 here in just a minute. Looking over my notes here on the subject of grievous. Genesis 18, verses 20 and 21. And the Lord said, Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it, which has come unto me, and if not, I will know. God is long-suffering. God is patient. But I'll tell you what, God is about done with all this sodomy stuff. All this transgender, and we're not even, you know... Uh, a man's born and he's not a, a man anymore. He's a woman, but now he's not a woman. He's an alien and he's not, you know, uh, all this stuff that's coming out with. Sex perversion is something that's repulsive in God's sight. God's design was for a man and a woman. And that's what the scriptures teach. Yeah, but there, what, but if we go to the Hebrew and if we change some of the meaning, man and a woman, Anything else is very grievous in, in God's sight. And by the way, a man and a woman outside of wedlock is also grievous in God's sight. That's called fornication if they're not married. If they're married and the man leaves his wife and goes joins himself with a harlot, that's adultery. Grievous. Grievous. Hmm. Their judgment is coming. Revelation chapter 16. We'll go to verses 3 through 6. Interesting thing here. And the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea, and it became as the blood of a dead man, and every living soul died in the sea. And the third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and fountains of waters, and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the waters say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and wast and shalt be, because thou hast judged thus. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. Hmm. That's a rather interesting thing. Okay. Who is it talking about? What's going to be the religion of the time of Jacob's trouble? Roman Catholicism. Uh, what is salvation for a Roman Catholic today? They're blood drinkers. See, oh no, it's grape wine. It's a, a wine from grape and, you know, fermented grape juice and stuff. No, it's blood. They teach it's blood. If you, I mean, you know, Catholicism today is just like anything else. It's so watered down and whatever else. They're going to revive it back to being radical again, though, in the future, when the Antichrist shows up and he's the final pope. But, uh, and their savior and their Christ, and uh, they do the war on Islam and everything else. That's what's coming. But true Roman Catholicism, true Roman Catholic teaching with transubstantiation is that the wafer and the wine become literal flesh and blood. And centuries ago, if you said, no, it's just symbolic, they'd kill you for it. Well, first, they'd torture you to death. Can't forget that part. But they'd kill you. They'd murder you. Happened in the millions of people for different reasons, different infractions. Some parent teaches their child the Lord's Prayer in English, off to be tortured and murdered. Some parent does this, you know, that, whatever. Some Christian comes out and tries to read the Bible for themselves, kill them. Somebody's trying to translate the Bible, kill them. Somebody says, no, the, the, I reject the mask, kill them. You know, yeah, torturing heretics. And they still have the office of Inquisition too, by the way. So, but it's just funny. I, I thought that was interesting that the Lord gets revenge on the Roman Catholic system and says, they've shed the blood of saints and the martyrs of Jesus. Hey, give them blood, blood to drink. You want to believe that you're saved by drinking blood? Okay, here you go. All the water in the world turns into blood. You know? It's really something. And of course, Revelation chapter 17 will be the next study that we're going to do. We're going to see more details about this Mystery Babylon system, this Roman Catholic system. So, interesting. Daniel chapter 12, verse 4. Cracks me up too. You know, you see these uh, people... You know, selling survival goodies, you know, and you've got to start prepping to get ready for the the tribulation, you know, stuff. 
I don't know of too many uh, filters that are going to filter out blood and get you some water from blood. I don't think so. You say, well, it's such a mean thing, isn't it? Well, Daniel chapter 12, verse 4 says, But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. Let me tell you something. I believe God had some mercy on Catholics back in the past. I do. I really do. Uh, I, you know, when you had people that were just, I mean, the dark ages, you couldn't get, even get a Bible and, and who's going to tell you the truth. I think that there was some mercy from God. Still think that Catholics went to hell if they never repented of that thing. But, uh, you know, put their faith in Jesus Christ. But the whole point is, today, that mercy is gone. All right? No Catholic, no Roman Catholic out there has any right at all to say, I never heard the truth. I, I, I couldn't find the truth. Any Roman Catholic today can have access to the internet, number one. Number two, there are books that are written. There are tracts that are written. There are other people. Even you get some older person doesn't know how to use the, use the internet. If they have questions, they can talk to somebody or whatever else. You know, pray to God, call to God and say, God, I want to know the truth. No Roman Catholic today has any excuse at all. Knowledge has increased to the point we're not in the dark ages anymore as far as things being banned and whatever else. And you can't get a King James Bible in a Catholic country and whatever else, you know. I mean, we've been contacted recently by somebody from the Vatican saying that they've been watching some of our videos and things. And, and uh, they say they're saved. I don't know one way or the other and stuff, you know. And they've been witnessing the priests and things. I don't know. If they're saved, the Lord, I think, is going to eventually get them out of the Vatican system. But the whole point is, somebody in the Vatican, an employee of the Vatican, can watch our videos. So don't give me this stuff of, well, they, why would God pour out His wrath and fury upon people when they just they couldn't find out? Anybody could find out. Back to Revelation 16. Nobody is going to have an excuse when they stand before God. Well, yeah, you know, I lived in the 21st century, but I, I just, I didn't know anything was wrong with my, you know, Catholic system. Wrong. Revelation chapter 16, verse 7. Here's a real good verse for the atheists out there. And I heard another out of the altar say, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are thy judgments. You know what the number one objection from atheists is? Why would a loving God, if God is so loving, why would He damn people to hell and burn them forever? I mean, you read the Old Testament and God's telling these Jews to go in there and kill everybody. Men, women, children, little babies, kill them all. I just don't think that that's just. I can't believe in a God that would send people to hell. That's exactly what they think. You know why? Because they don't believe that His judgments are true and righteous. That's why. But you see, our word of God here says, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are thy judgments. God knows the heart. The Bible talks about that God is eventually going to judge the secrets of men. He's going to judge the thoughts. Every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment, whether it be good or evil. God judges it all. So you might look and say, Why would he damn that old woman to hell? I don't understand. That dear old sweet old woman, she'd make cookies for the neighbors and she was such a wonderful, you know, nice woman. Why would God, why would a loving God send somebody like that to hell to burn forever? Why? True and righteous are his judgments. He knows. You might be able to deceive other people out there as an atheist. You might be able to come out and say, I'm a good person. I'm a nice person. I do things. I hold doors for older women and I help them put groceries in the back of their car and I help them across the road and I'm nice and I'm a community person and whatever else. But God knows what goes on behind the scenes. God knows what goes on in your head, in your thoughts. You say, well, still, okay, well, you know, maybe I'm not perfect, but to, to burn me forever? Uh, that's your decision. God never damned anybody to hell. He sent His Son to die on the cross to pay for your sins, and you say, no, don't want it. Then go to hell. Why? True and righteous are His judgments. That's why. You get to a point in life where you realize this world is not it. 
The things in this life do not satisfy. I've tried them. They don't work. There has to be something more to this life than just me being an animal that was just created by a random accident billions of years ago down through and here I am and then I just live and I die and that's it. What's the point? What's the point? What a sad existence. You're no different than a skunk or a snake or a lizard or a spider or a fly. That's all you are. If you go to hell out there and you're an atheist, and you end up in hell, it's because you fought God your whole life. That's why. True and righteous are His judgments. And you come to that point of judgment where you say, I know I'm a sinner. I don't have a chance. I'm not going to make it. What am I going to do? Get a good lawyer? Jesus Christ? He will not, you know, not only will He plead your cause, He'll actually take the criminal punishment for you. He died in your place. And you think that you're going to reject that and be okay and God's going to be, you know, if there is a God, you say that, you know, please. <laughs> okay, science, science hasn't proved anything that God does not exist. Give me a break. Everything out there came about as a random accident billions of years ago. You're an idiot if you believe that, all right? And the only reason, again, you know, well, let me say this, another very important point. You don't see many people getting judged right now. Why? Because God is giving us that opportunity to say, okay, I'm going to let a few more in, and then His wrath and His fury is going to come down on this earth. And so you see people, you go, they did it. They got away with it. They did it. They got away with it. I guess I can do it too. That's foolish. Very foolish. You have to get to a point where you realize God's judgments are true and righteous. And He'll judge you to the point of saying, okay, you're a sinner. It's a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. He called sinner, He calls sinners to repentance. Are you a sinner? Then you qualify to be saved. If you're not a sinner, then God can't save you. Simple. It's very simple. Salvation is a very easy thing. It really is. People try to complicate it, and it's not complicated. All right, let's continue on. Uh, verses 8 through 10. Let's read that. And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, and power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat, and blasphemed the name of God, which hath power over these plagues, and they repented not to give him glory. And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seed of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues for pain. Notice two very important things here. Okay, Fourth angel pours out his vial upon the sun, and power is given unto him to scorch men with, with uh, fire. Okay, And then they have great heat there in the next verse. Verse 10, what happens? The lights go out. Hmm. Did you know that there's such a thing as called a solar flare? I, I think it's called a geomagnetic. I have an article on it here. Geomagnetic storm or something like this. Uh, yeah, geomagnetic storms. Okay, there was a couple of them. Uh, there was one, uh, the Carrington flare, uh, a Carrington event, they call it. You know, you can research this thing. I'm not going to get into a whole lot of that. But basically, if you have this solar flare thing and it and there's a big from the sun you know it'll fry all the electrical appliances and things we can take some of that heat and whatever else but electrical appliances can't take that it's that magnetic type mixes with the magnetic field and just cooks everything and there was a back in the uh, late 1800s i believe it was they had some of the telegraph lines and some of the early things back then and the solar flare occurred and it just like basically cooked it all um, back then, well, you know, it's all nuts. The telegraph thing doesn't work. Let's put some new wires up. Uh, the average person was probably just like, wow, it was really hot, you know, the other day there. You know, you go up to the average person in the late 1800s and you say, you know, what'd you do when the power went out? They go, the what? <laughs> you know, the electric, you know. I mean, how did your iPhone work? They'd be like, my what? <laughs> you know? 
That stuff wasn't there. So back then, well, not a big deal. Today? Hmm. Big difference. Big difference. You know, again, you have this uh, preterist review or whatever these people, they try to say that uh, all the events of Revelation took place in the first century. And I mean, some of these stuff, you know, people say, could you do a video on this? And I'm like, I don't need to do a video. It's so incredibly stupid to believe that. I don't have to debunk anything with it. If you believe all the events of Revelation took place in the first century, you got some real mental problems, all right? I mean, the biggest one is Jesus Christ comes back at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble and he rules and, reign for a th rules and reigns for a thousand years. And then the earth is burned up after that. And the great white throne judgment and things, you know, happens after that. Then we enter eternity. Oh, uh, well, let's see. Gee, um, I think we're well past a thousand years and we're still going here on the earth. You know, and uh, I don't remember there being a mark of the beast that controlled buying and selling. But see what these preterist uh, wing nuts do is they spiritualize everything. They say, well, uh, when John was saying about the mark there, taking the mark to control buying and selling, what he meant is that the mark was somehow, uh, med you know, they, they come up with all this stuff. Uh, anybody that tells you that the events of Revelation happened in the first century, um, just say, uh, okay, you know, have a nice day, you know, just kind of walk away from them quickly. Uh, you're dealing with somebody who's mentally sick, all right? Absolutely nuts. And this, this whole thing, what if this, uh, you know, this thing of Revelation chapter uh, 16 here, verses 8 through 10, what if that happened in the first century? Solar flare, and all the lights go out. How do lights go out when there's no electricity? I mean, verse 10, uh, And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues for pain. Why would his kingdom be full of darkness? Can't they just light a torch? Um, or perhaps, you know, this is actually something that's going to be happening in, the, happening in the future when people are so dependent upon electrical lighting, they have no idea how to actually have, you know, light from another source that's not electric yeah please do not fall for this thing this stupid nonsense of uh the revelation took place in the first century and it was mostly poetic and whatever else and john was you know he didn't mean it to be taken literally okay <laughs> i'm not going to say a whole lot more much more on that you know i don't really have a desire to do much of a study on that because it's just so plain crazy but that's what i believe happens in revelation chapter 16 verses 8 through 10 solar flare and then the lights get knocked out electricity gets knocked out that's another reason why this it's so funny this whole mark of the beast system they're all this you know high tech and we're gonna have robots taking jobs and all this other stuff that people are just nuts you know mark zuckerberg coming out and we're gonna have global government and people are going to be forced to have you know the facebook guy if you don't know um, we're going to have a universal income or something like this. I saw not too long ago, a couple, like a week or so ago, I guess he was saying about that and this, um, oh, I can't think of the guy's name. This, uh, other little dweeb, uh, that's coming out Musk or something like this, Elon Musk or something. I don't know. Sounds like a cologne, but, uh, you know, some stinky cologne made out of petrochemicals. But, you know, he's coming out, oh, robots, you know, we're going to have to make rules for robots. Hey, all this little technology stuff is going to fail big time. I mean, today, again, grocery store today, earlier today, and we're there, and, it's, and they're like, you know, they got this, this woman in front of me at the cash, you know, the checkout thingy, and she's like, she's got a, a check. She writes a check for her groceries, common practice years ago, and they're like, okay, you know, and they're like trying to put it through this scanner thing and whatever else, and it's like, oh, it's not working, and manager's coming over, and they're like looking at their computer screen, they're pushing things. Did you try doing the thing? Like, yeah, I tried to try that, and, and it's, a, it's a check, you know? I mean, look at her driver's license to confirm the name on the check. You do a thank you. Good, have a good day, you know? we, we got to scan it into the system and stuff. I, I'm not really sure to... You know, and she's like, should I use a credit card? Well, I don't know. We could maybe try it. And he's like, but we've been having a hard time with that too today. I'm like going, you know, go to the post office and it's like, I'd like to send this box. Okay, well, we're going to have to scan it here and we got to 
typing a whole bunch of stuff into the computer. I'm not really sure. And I was talking to an older woman that works at the local post office here. And she was like, you know, back years ago, it was just a simple thing. I could have you out of here in about a couple minutes. And now it's like you got to scan it. And you think it's going to get better, you know? I mean, you know, the, the iPhone, whatever number it is right now, you know, it's got some bugs and stuff and it's got some things. But the next one that comes out is going to be even better, you know. I mean, yeah, the computer systems are bad now, but we're going we're gonna to get it fixed one of these days, you know. And what they're doing, actually, it's going to get to that point where the whole system is just going to go and just flop. People aren't going to know what to do. Again, how could that have happened in the first century? Solar flare, lights go out. First century fulfillment? Please. Future fulfillment? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. People don't know how to live without technology. All the time. I mean, these iPhone things. I hate iPhones. If you haven't gathered that from my videos yet. But these iPhones, you know, they're taking them. You say, what do you think about such? Well, let me check it out. Oh, yeah, okay. And they put it back in their pocket. You know, I'm not sure. Um, let me just get a tape measure here real quick, and I can measure the door. Well, I can look it up online quick. <laughs> you know, and actually, I had a, I sold a vehicle to the one the one time this guy, and and he comes in, and he was like, you know, I was, he said, you know, how many or what's this or whatever, and he came after dark, and I was like, well, let me get a flashlight. He's like, oh, it's okay. He gets his iPhone out, and he's like pushing the iPhone, and, you know, and he gets a flashlight app or something like this, and he's like. Shine out. Okay, I can kind of see it. I'm just like, get a flashlight, you know? I mean, just... but it's going to be okay because it'll survive, you know, the solar flare and the Carrington event and stuff in the time of Jacob's Trouble. Let's continue. Verse 11. So I'm not supposed to be smiling or laughing in my studies because people say I never do that. You know, I'm just serious, and I hate everybody, and I hate everything, and I'm the only one that's right, and all that stuff like that. <laughs> you know, somehow they miss it when I laugh and when I'm joking, and the vast majority of my preaching is not yelling and stuff. It's gentle and calm and whatever, but that's that doesn't count, you know. Yeah. Verse 11, Revelation 16, verse 11. And blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and repented not of their deeds jump up to verse 9 again they repented not to give him glory verse 11 repented not of their deeds wait a second here um i thought repentance means going from unbelief to belief but how does that work when you actually have these two verses verses 9 and 11 call 911 god has a good sense of humor you know but how does it work when you have two verses where God is saying give, saying that they should be repenting and they're not to people who've taken the mark of the beast. Hmm. You mean to tell me God would expect lost people to have an ability to repent? Repenting of their deeds? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Hmm. How about that? Verse 12. And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. Oh, you know, America is the most powerful nation right now. No, it's not. America is a joke. Okay, um, another thing, I mean, there's just so much stuff going on right now in this world. It just it makes my head spin, you know, and I, I'm, I'm like always going, okay, I got this really good article. Somebody sends me something real good and I'm like, okay, I got to do a whole study on it. And it's just like, I'm getting just a flood of information coming in now for me to do detailed studies on each thing. It's like, there's just not even time anymore. Uh, prophecy is speeding up so quickly. It's just, it's incredible. But, you know, another thing I've been seeing is, uh, I'm, we're trying to sell things right now because of having to move here in the very near future and we're doing our best to sell things and it used to be I'd put stuff on Craigslist or whatever and, and I'd get people and they'd come and they'd say okay you know I uh, 
would you take such and such for? Yeah, sure, you know, I can do that for you. Or, yeah, well, I'll, I'll meet you halfway. We'll go to, you know, this amount, whatever else. And okay. They get the cash out and they say, okay, here you go, count it. You know, yeah, it's all there. Good. Well, thank you, you know, whatever. Now it's like I literally have stuff for sale. There's people contact me. Yeah, you know, I don't have the money for that. You know, could we trade something or could, you know, people don't have cash. People are poor in this country. The illusion of wealth is still there. But it amazes me. I mean, I go into stores and I see people, they'll buy like a, a, a drink and, and some, a stick of gum or something, you know, or a, piece, a, a little package of gum, and they're paying for it with a credit card. And I'm going, you know, doesn't anybody pay with cash anymore? No, because you see, we live in a debt-based system. And a debt-based system creates people that are enslaved. I mean, you know, if somebody's in debt and they're able to make payments and things like that and whatever else, and you're not just drowning yourself in debt, well, okay, I understand that. Some of that's kind of unavoidable in this day and age. Uh, it's crazy. But, you know, the, a lot of people, it's just like, again, times have changed. It used to be I'd be dealing with people and they'd say, yeah, come and, you know, they pay, here you go and stuff. People don't have the money anymore. Why? Because America's about finished. Yeah. It's not the kings of the West. It's the kings of the East. So not only is it America going down, it's also Canada. Yeah. You know, again, I believe my theory, and it's just a theory, I'm not teaching this as Bible doctrine, but I believe what's going to happen is when the rapture occurs, the West is going to get blamed because there's more Bible-believing Christians in America and Bible-believing ministries and things in America than any other country and a good amount up into Canada as well. And I think what's going to happen is I think America is just going to get nuked and most of the big cities are going to be gone and people out in the countryside are probably going to be living, but it's going to be a very rough life into the time of Jacob's trouble. They'll still be controlled and whatever else eventually, or maybe they'll just be used as slaves or something by other countries. I don't know. Uh, but the whole point is, that's why, again, I'll reiterate this again, it's so important for the Vatican to get out there that America is Mystery Babylon. Because when America gets destroyed shortly after the rapture, then people say, Babylon has fallen. Oh, here's Jesus Christ has returned. See? Antichrist shows up. Yeah, I believe that that's what's going to happen. I just found that very interesting there, that the kings are from the east. So again, you see who's that? Well, China, Russia, Turkey, Iran, all the eastern superpowers. They're going to join together and wipe America off the face of the earth. I believe that. Revelation 16, verses 13 through 14. Let's continue. It says here, And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For these are the spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the, that great day of God Almighty. I find that very interesting. Uh, I'm not going to show a picture of it here just for sake of time, but you can watch my Real Bible Version Issue Exposed documentary. It's on my backup channel, also on this channel, broken up into smaller segments. Um, but in that documentary, I actually show the University of Salamanca in Spain. It was one of the universities where Ignatius de Loyola was trained. Uh, you know, the founder of the Jesuit order, he was trained there. And the NIV was partly translated at that university. And they have all this fancy scroll work outside in the stone, you know, the, the gargoyles and all that junk up there. And they have one, there's a, there's a skull looking down. And on top of the skull is a frog. You know, weird, weird thing. I mean, you know, check out the documentary. It's in there. Uh, I'm not going to, like I said, I'm not going to put the picture up in here. But you got this university where the founder of the Jesuits was educated. And on the outside of the university, they got a skull carved into the thing with a frog on its head. Rather strange, isn't it? And of course, you know, you get into the whole thing, too, of uh, the cherubim. You know, that there's basically four of them right now. I think the, you know, and there's a, you know, the fifth one would have been Satan at one point in time. And four, there's 
different creatures represented. The fifth one would be the reptilian, you know, uh, level. Well, uh, a frog is essentially they're amphibious, but they're in the reptile family. Probably nothing to that, I'm sure, too. It's coincidence, you know, coincidence. But notice there in verse um, 14, for they are the spirits of devils working what? Miracles. Better get a hold of that one, too, okay? Uh, go back in your Bible to Mark chapter 5. I've talked about this in other studies, but again, might be some new people. So I'm going to show you what the Bible teaches about this thing of these spirits of devils working miracles. Mark chapter 5, verses 1 through 8. Let's see here what the marks of somebody that's possessed with devils is. It says here, And they came over unto the other side of the sea, into the country of the Gadarenes. And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tomb a man, tombs a man with an unclean spirit, who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no, not with chains, because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces. Neither could any man tame him. And always night and day he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. Verse 6. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him. Isn't it weird how the modern churches place so much emphasis on worship? Worship teams, worship pastor, worship leader, worship, 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 worship. Come worship with us. All are welcome. Come worship with us. Show me that in Scripture, please. Where Christians are meeting together and saying, hey, everybody's welcome. Come on in. Let's come worship. Rather strange. Verse 7, And cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. For he said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And he asked him, what is thy name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. You mean to tell me somebody that's possessed with devils would, number one, worship the Lord, number two, know exactly who he is, and be able to say things that would deceive most professing Christians? Yeah. You know, I'm not going to mention any names or anything. I mean, Corbin <coughs> Sundergaard, <coughs> excuse me, um, <coughs> he's doing lots of miracles, isn't he? And, you know, like a Benny, Benny Hinn, <coughs> excuse me, a little cold there. And there's a lot more I could, uh, you know, names I could cough up. Smiling again, I shouldn't do that. Go to Luke. Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4, verses 33 through 34. Again, look at this. And in the synagogue there was a man which had a spirit of an unclean devil, and cried out with a loud voice, saying, Let us alone, what have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. You get somebody standing up in one of these Babel buildings in the worship time and say, I believe in Jesus. He's the Holy One of God. Everybody in there be going, Praise the Lord. Oh, what a spirit-filled Christian. No, actually it's a devil. Jump over to verse 41 in the same chapter. And devils also came out of many, crying out and saying, Thou art Christ the Son of God. And he rebuked them, suffer, rebuking them, suffered them not to speak, for they knew that he was Christ. Hmm. Spirits of devils work miracles. Spirits of devils talk about Jesus. Spirits of devils worship Jesus. Oh, Brian Dunlinger, he's just so harsh, harsh, isn't he? Yep. He just judges so many people. Don't have a choice. And I can judge people because I have a perfect standard. Not here. And you can hold the standard too. And you can judge anything according to the standards of God's Word, including me. We need to have a standard, brethren. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Again, very familiar verses if you know anything about this ministry. I've gone over this before. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 13 through 15. 
For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Look at that in verse 15. Therefore it is no great thing. You shouldn't be surprised. You know, it's not like, oh, you mean to tell me that this guy I've been watching is, is a bit, you know, he's a Satanist or something like that? It's no great thing. Paul's just like, yeah, it's no great thing, <laughs> you know. Satan's transformed into an angel of light, so it's no great thing that his ministers are doing the same thing. The number one profession of high-level Satanists is preaching. I think it was Johnny Todd said that many, many years ago, and I believe that. I believe that 100%. You get a Satanist, the number one thing that they want to do is preach. That's why I've told people, I learned it from Ruckman, back here. I learned it from him, and I tell other Christians, I've told a lot of new Christians this, your number one enemy as a Christian will be professing Christians. Number one, write it down, mark it down, burn it into your mind, always remember it. The number one enemy for Christians is professing Christians. Number one. That's why you keep your eyes on Jesus. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in His wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. It's an old hymn. Okay? Yeah. Make it about Jesus. Make it about His Word. Don't look too closely at other people that profess to be saved. You see? Have grace for people. Exhort people. Whatever else. But don't be too shocked when you find out that they're snakes. And it's hard sometimes. I've had to, to find out some bad stuff about some of the people that I once thought were brethren. But uh, let's go back to Revelation chapter 16. It's just incredible. Revelation chapter 16. And I'll tell you right now, if I looked to the brethren to uh, sustain me and keep me strong in the faith, I'd have quit a long time ago. A long time ago. Um, Jesus Christ is the reason that I'm saved. And this King James Bible is my guide, my, my source for all truth. And if I ever fall from that standard, I'm not going to make it. It's not going to make it. Just as simple as that. Jesus and His Word. That's it for you. Verse six, or excuse me, verse fifteen. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Who's that written to? It's written to a saint in the time of Jacob's trouble. How do you know? Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Do you have to watch? Well, you know, looking forward to His coming, yes, sure. Uh, love His appearing, we're told to love His appearing, sure. But we don't have to watch. Let me show you who does. Revelation chapter 7. Revelation chapter 7, uh, verse 13 through 14. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Scripture after scripture after scripture, faith and works in the time of Jacob's trouble. They have to watch. They have to endure to the end. They can't take the mark of the beast. They have to keep the commandments. Revelation 14, verse 12. Over and over and over. Faith and works. Faith and works. It's right there. And all these heretics, they come out and they say, Brian Danlinger is teaching a false gospel. I would be if I was saying it's for today. Faith and works for today. I don't teach that. Okay, James chapter 2, another very 
popular thing that Catholics will go to. You know, if faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. You know, and things. Well, that's for true for the uh, people it's written to. You know, James of the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad. Greeting. First verse of the book of James. You know, you ought to read the whole thing in context. We don't have to keep anything. All right. But the saints in that time do. That's why you see it there again in verse 15 of Revelation 16. Let's continue. Verse 16 here, Revelation 16, verse 16. And he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. You know. Um, and they gathered them. No, this. wait a second here. We've got to go back to the Greek. Uh, well, it's over there. I, I you know, don't want to go to there. I'll just give you my incredible wisdom here. Um, when it says he gathered them together, it actually means they gathered themselves together. Because you see, God is just outside of the whole thing and he's just powerless up there. He's like a little, you know, just up there biting his fingernails going, oh, what's going to happen next? Oh, you know, <laughs> completely out of control. And, you know, there's Christians down there on the earth and they're, some are taking the mark and God's going, what am I going to do? Oh, I told them I was, you know, they're sealed until the day of redemption. I promised them. But yet I said over there that anybody that takes the mark goes to hell. Oh, you know, God's in control of the whole thing, brethren. He gathered them together. We do not serve some weak, powerless God. Go back in your Old Testament to Zephaniah, the minor prophets, right before you get to the book of Matthew. We aren't serving some kind of a God that's, that's up there just kind of, you know, doesn't know what's going on and what's happening. And I, oh, what am I going to do about that? <laughs> no. Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 8. This is one you should mark down. When you look at all the scheming of all these world government people in the European Union. We're going to come together and we're going to fight this and you know, blah, 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 all this stuff. Zephaniah 3, 8. Therefore wait ye upon me. Mm -hmm. saith the Lord until the day that I rise up to the prey for my determination it's God's determination is to gather the nations that I may assemble the kingdoms to pour upon them mine indignation even all my fierce anger for all the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy God's wrath true and righteous are his judgments he's bringing them together what a terrible... You can get out of it. You can get saved right now. You can go up at the rapture. You see? <laughs> Just figure it out, you know? Yeah, I used to listen to Alex Jones, like, religiously. You know, I'd back when I first got saved, I was, you know, into the prophecy thing. And, and I was thinking, oh, Alex Jones, he's telling the truth. I had a lot to learn. I was a little bit green. But, you know, and he's, you know, we're going to defeat the new world order. We will defeat the new world order. Well, then you're going to defeat God. Because God is the one that's going to gather them together. You read it here in Zephaniah 3 8, and you read it back in Revelation chapter 16. He gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. The Lord's behind it. But you see, he isn't veiled and secret and whatever else, and you gotta you gotta kind of somehow come to him. He spells it out plainly in his word, and he says, Hey, there's going to be coming this one world government. There's going to be the Antichrist and he's going to have this cashless system, Mark of the Beast. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that, you know, and stuff. And oh, by the way, I'm going to be the one gathering them together to, for the Battle of Armageddon. What do I do? Well, going back in here right now, as if you're a Christian in the church age, go on back in here to the Pauline epistles and get saved. Read the book of Romans. Read John and Romans, actually. Be a good place. You're a time of Jacob's trouble, Saint. Well, then you go over to here, Revelation 14, verse 12, and you go over to here and go over to there and read those. He spells it out. Tells people what they need to do to get saved. Tells people how to get out of that coming judgment, that coming wrath. And by the way, again, for these posty toasty tribbers that, you know, I wish the pre trib rapture was true. For years I believed it, and now I don't because I was just shown too much proof and th you know yeah sure um, for those posties out there that are trying to say that the wrath of God comes later because you know they can't deal with first Thessalonians chapter 5 and they go oh, what do I do with that where it says 
God hath not appointed us to wrath. Well, uh, the wrath comes later. Uh, no, actually, when you read Zephaniah 3.8 and you understand that God is the one that's bringing the kingdoms together to pour upon them his jealousy, the fierceness of his wrath, essentially. You see? It starts at the beginning. God's wrath starts at the beginning. But let's uh, keep going here. Re verse 17, Revelation 16, verse 17. And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came out a great voice uh, out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, It is done. I thought that was kind of fin interesting because Jesus, when he dies on the cross, he cries, It is finished. Here, I believe the Lord is the one crying, you know, saying the thing there, It is done. So it's like, either take the cross or you're going to end up here. Where God just says, I'm done with that whole thing down there. He doesn't going to mess with men messing up the planet anymore. I mean, really, what does this earth need? It needs the Creator to come down here and show men how to do it. Because the Creator, God Almighty, has been saying, you can just be down there and just do it your way. But he gets to a point where he says, it is done. No more. Really wonderful when that time comes. Verses 18 through 20. Let's read that. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings. And there was a great earthquake such as was not since men were upon the earth. So mighty an earthquake and so great. And the great city was divided into three parts. And the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And look at this. Verse 20. And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. Can you imagine that? The level of destruction that's going to happen. The cities flattened. You see these uh, apocalyptic type movies and things, you know, and stuff, and they show these cities, you know, standing, and, but the windows are all busted out. Uh-uh. They fall. Boom. Flat. You know, hey, where's New York City? A pile of junk over there. Where's Los Angeles? Rubble. Where's uh, Dubai? Junk. Vatican City? Sorry. Over there. All the priceless antiques and all the treasures of the Vatican? And... Trash. Where's Mount Everest? Oh, that little valley over there. You know? Huh? Interesting. Verse 21. And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent. And men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, for the plague thereof was exceeding great. You know what a talent is? Approximately 80 to 90 pounds. I've seen videos of people that uh, get into hail storms where the hailstone's about the size of a golf ball. It'll dent the hood of the vehicle. It'll smash the windshield. I saw this video years ago. These guys sitting there at some Helly Davidson rally or whatever, Sturgis or something, I think it was. And they're sitting in their vehicle, and it's like golf ball size hail. Starting to so, just shattering their windshield. And they're sitting in there, you know, bleep, 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 you know, and stuff. What's going on? Well, there's a hailstorm, and they're blaspheming God. Oh, my. You know, they use God's name as a cuss word. Or they'll say the Lord Jesus' name as a cuss word. Um, would it be a stretch of the imagination to think of people today in that situation blaspheming God? No, we're right here. About ready to happen. And by the way, this whole thing, this mega earthquake thing, I was going to talk about some articles on that. You know, there are geologists that are coming out and saying with all of the different fault lines and stuff and all the shaking and everything else and the hydraulic fracking and and a lot of these other things that are going on uh earthquakes have increased you know dramatically just as jesus christ said that they would uh there's all kinds of things happening i mean just a couple months back over there in italy uh this whole city was just like flattened 
Interesting. It's going to happen even more so in the future. And one of the mountains split horizontally. You see a big mountain peak and a big, big crack in it. You haven't seen anything yet. Jesus Christ talked about all these are the beginning. It's nice having an ATV trail right up the road here and you got goofballs cruising back and forth past the place. Sorry for the noise, but, uh, you know, I mean, we have, we're seeing the beginning of sorrows. And, uh, I mean, I, you know, I, I get confrontational with atheists and things, and, it, and of course, it, it rises up their pride and stuff. And, I, you know, some of it, I'm, I, I, they do get to me sometimes, and it ticks me off, and I write some sarcastic thing. And, but, you know, behind it all, I, I, I care about them. I understand why a lot of people are atheists. Because they've been wounded by childhood conversion. They've been wounded by going, being forced into religion, organized religion. And so they come out and they say, I reject the whole thing. That's the point of organized religion. That's why Satan is behind it. That's why his ministers appear as the ministers of righteousness. Because they understand if they can lead you into a false conversion, it's not going to work for you. And you'll eventually turn on God and say, somebody tries to come and witness to you. Say, yeah, I, I used to do that. Yeah, I've, I've heard that stuff before. Don't even talk to me about it. I tried that. doesn't work. It's sad. It's very sad. Um, but I can tell you right now, uh, things are winding up. We're not very far away from this stuff happening. The uh, events in the book of Revelation... Even scientists are starting to realize it. You can't keep having a whole bunch of small little earthquakes without rattling something loose, and all of a sudden you have a big one. And I saw again, there was some article, um, you know, there's so much stuff out there right now, I can't even talk about it all, it's just crazy. But some article was saying about out in California, Washington State, going down into California, there's some fault line, and uh, it was like some massive big earthquake, you know, and they say it, you know, back in the 1800s, and they say it happens every 120 to, you know, 130 years or something like this. I forget the exact numbers, and and um, but they said you know it's going to happen in the next couple of years for California, and I thought, yeah, I believe that they're right on that because I do believe that there will be other earthquakes in the time of Jacob's trouble. Uh, it's going to be a real bad time, but there's going to be a mega earthquake that comes uh, such like there was never before seen on this earth and you have one chance to get out of it you say what's that Jesus Christ uh, the body of Christ right now is on the earth I'm part of the body of Christ I'm not Jesus Christ certainly not but I'm part of his body his blood was shed on the cross to pay for my sins he washed all my sins away I came to him by faith I said Lord I'm a sinner people you know a lot of people thought I was a good guy they really did uh, you know, I had childhood conversion, raised in church buildings and things like that, and I was morally a pretty decent guy, at least on the surface. My private life was a lot different, but uh, seemed like a pretty good guy. I wasn't a good guy. I was rotten, filthy, horrible, and I started looking at some of the Bible prophecy stuff, and I started to get a little bit scared. Well on my way to becoming a, a very much recognized wood-turning artist, by the way, too. I was getting into better and better galleries and bigger shows. And I just got to a point where I just dropped the whole thing and I said, whatever it costs me, whatever it takes, I need to know that I'm saved. And I'm not going to quit finding or quit trying to find the Lord until I know for sure that He saved me. <clears throat> and He did. I got down on my knees one night and I just remember just crying and just saying, Lord, I thought I was a Christian. I'm not a Christian. I, I, I couldn't even relate to the people in the Bible. Nothing in common with them. The Bible seemed like a foreign book to me. I'd open it up and be like, I don't even understand this book. You know? And it was an NIV, by the way, too. Didn't even have the King James Bible. But, you know, <clears throat> the Bible was a foreign book to me. And I remember I actually used to make fun of words from the King James Bible, not even knowing what I was doing. You know? And, uh, you know... And I remember I, I just I cried out to the Lord and I said, Lord, I need to I need to know I'm saved. I need to know for sure. And I said, I know that you died on the cross for me, and I I believe that. I believe that you were here on the earth and that you died and that that death is enough to pay for my sins. I 
but I need to know. I know I'm a sinner. I don't need to be convinced of that anymore. I'm not a good person. I'm rotten. I'm filthy. I'm wicked. Please, please save me. You know? And it wasn't some instant little, you know, sparkly gold dust came down from heaven and all of a sudden I'm just like, bling, I'm changed. I'm a new creature. That's not what happened. But what happened is I felt a sense of peace for the first time ever. And all of a sudden, my interest started to change. And whereas in the past I used to watch television just, on, you know, basically lived in front of a television, I'd come, I'd, you know, eat a meal in front of the TV and I'd, I just, just TV, 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 writing movies all the time. All of a sudden I couldn't watch television anymore. I didn't enjoy the blaspheming of my Lord's name. I didn't enjoy the profanity. I didn't enjoy the sexual content. All of a sudden things started to change. And the rock music I used to listen to, that started to change. And the attitudes and the ways and, and the speech that I had started to change. And many, many years went by. And the Lord called me to preach His Word. Yeah. And that's my prayer for everybody out there. Uh, there's not anybody out there that I don't want to see get saved. If the black pope came here tonight and said, Brian, could you please tell me how to get saved? I would sit down with my Bible and I would tell that man how to be saved from the King James Bible. And I'd spend all night, I wouldn't even go to sleep, telling him the gospel. Stephen Anderson comes along. Or any of the other little imps that, that you know are out there teaching wicked heresies and things. I'm, I'm a false convert. I need to get saved. I'll tell them how to get saved. I don't hate anybody. All right? But you have to understand that uh, God's judgment is coming, and His judgment is true and righteous. You're not going to escape it. The only way out of it is to take your judgment at the cross, where Jesus Christ died in your place. And you come and you say, I'm a sinner. I can't be saved by my own good works, by my own good deeds. I need to be saved. God, please save me. And don't do a flippant kind of a thing of, what do I got to pray? You know, just pray some little prayer. Okay, that's done. All right, good. I'm a Christian. No, 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 no. The old timers had a thing called praying through. They would get down on their knees and they'd stay there till they knew that they were saved. And then you get up and you look for those changes to start happening in your life. So, well, Brother Brian, I really haven't had those. Then get it figured out. If you haven't had a changed life, if there hasn't been a experience there where all of a sudden you feel that peace that passeth understanding the Bible talks about that a Christian is supposed to have, if you haven't felt that, if you haven't seen your interests start to change, then please, for your soul's sake, for eternity's sake, get it figured out today, not tomorrow. Not a week from today. The Bible says now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Get saved today. Get it figured out. There are things coming on this earth that are going to be so horrifying and so terrible. Why? Because God's judgments are true and righteous. It's coming. His judgment is coming. Flee from the wrath to come. I pray that you do that. Thank you for watching.